Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Live Talks Take Eight. We're very excited today because uh, this week we're checking in with Maura Nguyen Donahue and Elizabeth Hess, who are uh, talking about how professors and teaching artists and arts educators are responding to the quarantine and the global pandemic and what the future of this important field might look like going forward. Uh, first of all, we would love to thank all of La Mama's funders who make this programming possible for us to do every week. And we'd like to say if you would like to donate to make this possible in the future, we have La Mama Live. You can text La Mama Live to 44321. That's La Mama Live to 44321. Um, thank you for tuning in. I would just like to say uh, Maura Nguyen Donahue is an associate professor of dance and a faculty associate for the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College and CUNY, and also a member of La Mama's Great Jones Repertory Company since 1997. And Elizabeth Hess is an actor, playwright, director, arts educator, and artistic director of the newly formed company, The Hess Collective. And you have seen both of them perform at La Mama. Uh, we're so excited to have them both here today. So my first uh, thought, is I would love to go over to Elizabeth and just ask you, what is your role as an arts educator? How did you get involved? Where do you teach? What do you teach? Um, hi, everybody. First of all, Ryan, I want to say thank you to you and to all the people at La Mama for asking me to be a part of this. Um, I, I love the La Mama family, and you guys are just um, so supportive of us on so many levels. So it's lovely to be able to give back a little something. Um, so I've been doing this for about 20 years now, uh, teaching, and, um, and it wasn't a goal of mine initially. And um, I was sort of approached about teaching and I started off at NYU and I had a terrific boss there who basically let me go into that classroom and treat it like a laboratory. And uh, out of that, I developed my own approach to performance called Embodied Performance. And I published a book uh, with Macmillan about that um, just a couple of years ago. So that's me kind of in a nutshell. And I've taught a number of different places um, over the 20 years, including internationally. But um, NYU is my home and where I also uh, now just had my first Zoom uh, introduction. Amazing. And uh, Maura, going over to you, same question. We'd love to hear that. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. It's, um, it's so great to, uh, to be able to talk about this particular aspect of our lives. Um, I, let's see, when did I start? So I, in the early 90s, I spent some time up in Western Mass, like guest teaching as an artist, but I didn't really join academia until after I'd had a couple kids and went back and did the MFA also in Western Mass. Um, and so I was teaching in the five colleges, uh, Smith, Mount Holyoke, Hampshire. And then I joined the uh, City University of New York at Queens College actually about 12 years ago. Um, and I've been at Hunter College for the past, I think I'm now on my 11th year there. Um, so it's, it's been strangely suddenly over a decade of being this academic uh, entity, but I, I love the way in which the artistic practice of teaching um, is like a recipro the reciprocal relationship with, with the creative processes. Like what you learn, what you have to use as an artist in order to teach, and then what you use as a teacher in order to make feels like very, um, juicy territory. So um, I have to say I've enjoyed it a lot more than I thought. I really thought I was kind of going to do it to just get some health care for my kids, um, but it's really become quite the passion. That's amazing. So it looks like you both have a lot of experience under your belts doing arts education. Um, although I feel that nothing has ever happened quite like this quarantine during your careers in education. Um, <laughs> So that's sort of what we're gonna move on to is how has this quarantine affected you as educators? Um, how have you moved online? 
what were the decisions that were considered when you decided to move online? Um, and what has that experience been like? Wild. Um, I, I, was, so I was in rehearsal at La Mama for uh, my show Spoiled um, when all of this happened. And so that got uh, postponed at the same time that I was going online to teach. And I went, wow, what a, you know, amazing kind of confluence of, of uh, events. Um, and so I kind of just um, surrendered to the newness of it all. And, I, and to, just to be inventive and to be open. And I have to say that NYU was incredibly helpful in just giving us the basic tools to know how to go about it. Um, and then I just, I really wanna say one of the most amazing things about doing this was the collaborative relationship with the actual students in the Zoom sessions. Um, and I'm so grateful to them for just the way that they worked with me. Um, you know, we learned together. Yeah, I think we, um, am I muted? No, okay. Um, I think we were all, I mean, all us New Yorkers were in the midst of, of, uh, of so many things when this moment happened. It was really kind of this crazy screeching halt moment. Um, we, I was, had just did a public sharing for a fellowship that I was doing a dance-based project on care and kin, which feels really, appropriate and extremely related to, you know, sort of implementing those conversations and those practices directly to a digital, you know, a digital place of, of caretaking and kin making, um, you know, like everyone's trying to sort of find community in this moment of isolation. So that felt really kind of a prescient conversation. And I was also, um, I co-curate and co-produce the Esther Genius Festival, which is across the street from La Mama at the Crane. And we were in tech. We were also, you know, but it was other artists. I was trying to, you know, get other artists to go, but I was watching the, you know, I've been watching the news coming out of China and then been watching it coming out of Italy. And I was going, I, this is not this, you know, and asking folks at, at the, at Hunter and to prepare for this festival saying, this, this isn't gonna go how we how we want but we kept kind of plugging ahead as as if it was and I I sort of feel I don't know if um if Ryan you'll appreciate this but I kept being like can we put our prepper hats on like we need to be preppers right now and get ready for the apocalypse um and um and then it just came faster than we were ready for uh so I I feel like I want to yeah, just commend every student that made it through the semester and every faculty member who made it through the semester because it was a it was a bit of an ambush to um, that. And then of course, every artist I know who was preparing to premiere something who's still, you know, still trying to salvage that. So it's it was it was a uh, shocking and, and quite full of grief right at that moment. A lot of shows that just were lost in dreams. So that radically, that caused a really specific pivot in terms of how I was thinking digitally because my students, several of them who were choreographers lost their big show. Um, and so it was, you know, it, that rallied me to just try to figure out what do we do? I just- Of course, to, yeah, go ahead. I just want to jump on what Maura was saying about community. Um, and how beautiful actually that you were working on something related to that because I felt like it was an incredibly powerful um, experience in developing a very different sense of community but really palpable. I have a sense of um, connection with those students, a shared experience that's so unique and it was really reciprocal and uh, you can't manufacture that kind of community. Um, so yeah, it was an oppor weird opportunity, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's the thing I think with them. I was saying to, to some of my students, I said, okay, I, I'm about a week ago, I said, I see the lights of the Harbor. Um, so I, I, we're, we're getting there. I can see the lights of the Harbor, but, um, and I'm looking around at the crew and I'm so grateful that no one fell overboard and no one jumped ship. 
because it was really this effort of trying not to lose people and having people not quit. And I, I was just like, I'm so grateful you were an amazing crew because it felt like we were really trying to, it was such a journey. It was, it was like a tumultuous storm for us to try to move through. And I, yeah, and I, there's no other, there's no other group of students that I will ever go through that with again. So the, yeah. the like family and, and crew that everyone became was, was incredible. Yeah. As, as, uh, speaking of people not jumping ship, I have a lot of international students in the class that I was teaching this semester. And so, for example, one of my students uh, flew back to Beijing um, in the middle of this, and she was quarantined the moment she arrived for two weeks, and she was in a hotel. Class was from 10 to 1.30. Um, our time, 10 a.m. when she was she was taking class at 10:30 p.m. until 1:30 in the morning, quarantined in a hotel room, and an 18-year-old freshman. Oh my goodness! If that isn't an inspiration, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. She's just one example of a number of my students. I had one in Mexico City, one was in Paris, um, a number of them scattered throughout uh, the U.S. Um, but we were all there for each other and she hung in and they all hung in. Amazing. Um, earlier, Maura, when you were talking sort of about the mourning or the grief that people are feeling, I know a big thing for the teachers and educators and administrators has been the graduations that were supposed to take uh. place and those kinds of events or even just being near each other to say goodbye or to like wish each other the best. Can you both sort of talk a little bit about what that was like since that's been going on this month? Yeah, we um, we still are trying to have some kind of a celebration for those folks on Friday. So we're we're still planning that. Um, and one of the things I was trying to do was at least get them their free lunch delivered to them. <laughs> because we can't do that thing where we come together and eat a meal. Um, so that's like one of the ways I was trying to just make it a little bit more, feel a little bit more fun. Um, but um, that's definitely something I've just been observing. Um, I, I feel at least um, big shout out to a few of mine, like Simi and Kat and Lena, who I think might be watching right now, who are about to, to leave the, you know, the, the SS Spring 2020 at Hunter um, into this really crazy world. And I think one of the things that came up was was actually um, the fear of the end of the semester. You know, most seniors are like scared about what's coming, but also just like, get me out of here. But this particular unknown is so, so confusing. So I, I was like, let's unofficially continue to have class whenever we can. <laughs> you know, let's just continue making things. <laughs> I kind of said the same thing to my kids. I said, you know where to find me. Um, I also said, you know where to find each other. And uh, my situation is that the course that I offer is available to the entire NYU community. So I have from first year through to graduates. Um, so it wasn't like I had a senior graduating class. There were seniors within my class who were graduating. So the, the, the sense of community we had wasn't one where there are those who are all, you know, some are staying, some are moving on, some have graduated. And, and so the same as what you were saying, Maura, I had the feeling that they can find each other um, and I encourage them to find each other and to continue to network, partly because of the pandemic, but also partly because of the inspiration they gave each other as as fellow artists and innovators. Um, so hopefully that as much as we're grieving the loss of something, there was all the, also the introduction of something unexpected. Yeah. It feels like it has some continuity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things is we, I feel like when we can get to this sort of as we talk about the fall, I was reading something that Kathy Hastak had written and she's the founding director of the Futures Initiative actually for the Graduate Center of CUNY. And she was saying the, the primary thing we have to we have to prepare for actually is the trauma, is the trauma and the anxiety and the disorientation that the students are in and that the faculty are in. And if we don't address that as the reality, then we're, we're going to miss something. But I think in particular, 
the arts put the arts practice places are have been the place where the hope is seated. I think that that was um, that's something that we get to do is we actually can offer some outlet space for that, that sometimes the more sort of luxury courses, they, they don't give the student anywhere to put that energy. So I feel just really grateful that at this moment that my field is artistically based. Um, as, as, as troubled as the field is right now, as, as, you know, as much as the field is losing, I'm grateful as an educator that I get to you know, help students go into the unknown with curiosity, um, you know, with amplifying the curiosity instead of um, amplifying all of the fear. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think it's really interesting when you, Ryan, when you bring up this whole notion of the trauma and the grief, um, that in many ways, rather than avoid that, I really felt like we, we made space for it. We addressed it. We, we did work that in many ways, I would say address the inner landscape even more than I would normally um, do so. So, uh, you know, my, my sort of pedagogy has a lot of very strong physical engagement that then sort of one wants it to translate into inner impulses. Um, and so it kind of, I kind of flipped that so that we really focused on what I call the psychic landscape, the inner landscape, and then transform that into original pieces that the students then could partner and share and express. And so that was a way of taking the grief, the trauma, the uncertainty, and actually using that as a transformative tool through their art. Um, I know they were grateful for that. I was grateful for that. And I'm really interested, both of you teach uh, subjects that are so physical and you began the semester teaching that in person and then you had to move the students online to continue teaching the course. Um, I know Maura, you have like a little bit of the work to share, but I would love to hear from both of you about how you adapted teaching these physical subjects, these physical topics in the digital space. I'll just jump in. Initially, I was like, oh my goodness, what's the Zoom thing going to be? So I asked all my students to prepare like a, a three to four minute um, video based on the, the work that we'd done at the beginning of the semester, which was all this very physical work, which I call these behavioral states. Um, and it was wonderful. We shared those. So I put, they put them in a Google Drive. We shared them all. And they were in their environments doing all this wild stuff in their closets and in their backyards and with their cats. I mean, it was just fabulous and interesting and weird. But then that was sort of the end of that segment, refer, which referenced the earlier part of the live training. Um, and so when we then segued into the second half, I made major adjustments in terms of the curriculum uh, so, that the, the, so that the physical work became much, much more subtle. Um, and I did sensory work with them. I worked on different energy centers in the body um, and in, in, in ways that they could work in spaces like this, you know, I mean, this, this, this was their teaching space where we are today. This is their, this was where I worked with them and they had, you know, similar situation. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the glimpses into people's homes has been a whole other thing that, um, but actually that's, that's sort of related. So yeah, this, this moment happened and, and I, you know, I had to say, I'm, I was really grateful for my particular MFA because I had had a focus. My second reader was developing an arts and technology program. And my third reader was um, teaching arts and sociology because those I had been interested in that, um, but then didn't really use a lot of that knowledge because I was teaching in a dance department and there's other things that they need you to cover. Um, but so as this moment was happening, it was kind of this like, oh, look, how, look, my education is really worth something in this moment. <laughs> I mean, I but like that focus and I had found documents from 20, you know, the last time I had been trying to get the department to really do digital initiatives and get online was 2014. Like all the passwords were like dance 2014. I was like, oh, okay, so six years ago you, you gave up, but now look, like, you know things. So that whole, that moment of, of going, wait, I, I have a lot of the skills for this. And, um, and 
seeing the sort of grief of my students who were losing the big show they were going to get to do before, you know, in the historic K, K Playhouse, like, you know, some of them, the last thing they'll do before they graduate. Um, and saying, I, you know, I went back recently, looked at my messages from my text messages or our WhatsApp chat from there, just where I was like, it's gonna be okay. You're all gonna end the semester with a really beautiful dance film. You know, like we, we got this, I've been asking to teach this. We can, we can make this pivot and you're gonna have something you could send to a festival. Um, you know, and they were like, what? And still sort of caught up in the loss, but um, it's amazing what they ended up doing and being a La Mama, you know, Great Jones, DIY experimentalist, I was like, you're going to be able to do a lot of this yourself. We're going to show you a few things. Luckily, our technical director had a previous life uh, in film and TV. So I, you know, I was like, we'll get into these, get into these classes and let's talk some camera angles and stuff, you know, but it was students with a phone or a laptop trying to figure that out. And then um, the very first uh, La Mama Culture Hub downtown variety hour show was the very first act was broadcast from my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like a, a light board, up, and, you know, I wasn't even on, but it was, as soon as I saw that, I went, oh, we don't even just have to make the, the dance for camera, DIY dance for camera. We can actually do remotely, entirely remotely produced live stream performance. So this thing that some of our students were missing, which was performing, um, in particular, the MFAs, we, I was like, we can do this. So we partnered with, um, with Culture Hub to do uh, one night and we did four different programs. Uh, three of them were pre-recorded dance films. And then the Saturday night show included five live streamed performances from the Bronx to Brooklyn. So I'm gonna show just a little bit of that. Um, so that starts, the first three are the live streamed works and then there's a quick shift. And these are really quick cuts, but just to give people a sense of how the students really problem solved the making of these things. Um, so let me just do the share screen thing, which we all do, but then every time we do it creates all sorts of anxieties. Um, okay. And I'm not at the beginning of... There we go. <laughs> cared about found you that's the voice that plays like a tape on rewind rewind Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, Gorgeous. and I, I didn't want to take up a lot of time doing screen sharing, but uh, if, if folks go to hunterdances.com, you can see over 40 dance works um, like that. So you get to see the full range of, of you know, somebody just kind of dancing in their hallway to, to that last work, which was 
we have a class called lecture demonstration and that class is supposed is like the company experience so they learn several works and they tour to high schools around new york city and they were just getting ready to do that when everything went on pause so they didn't get to have any of that touring experience so they took at least one piece which was um choreographed by one of our mfas charisma J, and um you know i came in one class and was like you can do some things in zoom you know there's some things you can do and sort of at least and got a master uh, kind of master shot of it and then they reshot it a couple times and Lori Brungard who is our yoga and history teacher but has an MFA from City College in media did the editing to turn it into a group work so there's a lot there was a lot of not just like student collaboration but faculty collaborated in ways that had never happened before so it's um it's a, it's a really sort of beautiful situation and it was also a way to keep like keep our technical director and production manager essential you know like there was this fear at that moment um that they would be seen as not necessary for us because we didn't have theaters and shows and i was like no 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 i got plenty of shows for us to do <laughs> you're just gonna have to learn how to embed things into the facebook page <laughs> That has been such a theme, I feel, in all of the live talks is how all of the artists, um, so much of downtown performance especially has been in response to barriers or obstacles or figuring things out to make sure that somebody gets paid or that some venue is secured just to make sure that the work gets out no matter what. So that's really cool to yeah. hear. I saw the cat in the one. Isn't that so show. great? Fabulous. I love that. I wrote that into the description, like somebody's cat might make a cameo. And I actually was like, can we pay the cat through your student <laughs> activity funds? Um, I also do want to just mention, I want to give a shout out to one other faculty member who was really essential. Um, Tito Del Saz, who performed also in the live stream, I think, I believe is performing this Friday for Downtown Variety also. Um, he was, so I was teaching like advanced composition and the MFA studies of forms and Tito was teaching comp one. So real like first time choreographers. And so he, he was, he was really like taking people who were just, just coming out of the, sh you know, just coming out of the, the like into their own voice and then having to suddenly make something and then make something that goes you know from not just from studio showing but goes to like a film that then gets shown and then like you get way more hits than you ever would have gotten <laughs> in a live performance so he was a really great um uh, a great sort of partner in crime on that too so and so go see him if uh i think he's on on friday on friday yeah he definitely is yeah. um yeah it's gonna be a great lineup and uh, we, all, we have about 15 minutes left. And I wanted to say to everybody watching this on Facebook, a reminder, you can ask any questions in the comments and we'll be very happy to direct it to our panelists as we sort of wrap up. I wanted to sort of hear from both of you about how do you feel um, the future will look like? Uh, do you have an image of what will happen going forward? Do you have any plans or, um, how have you been communicating with your students and your institutions about that? It's a big, definitely a big question that might not have an answer. <laughs> it's such a big question and it's hard. Um, I actually shed some tears today. So um, it's, um, and, and part of this too, I just want to sort of reach into last night's Cafe La Mama talk with Karen Finley and George Emilio Sanchez, like just the, watching that sort of coping with the, you know, the pandemic and um, and George has always been a really important shoulder for me too because he also teaches in the CUNY system at the College of Staten Island and he's an active member of the union and organizing. I mean, I know that in terms of labor, we're we're really we're looking at some substantial cuts and I think we're trying as hard as we can to try to protect as many of our staff and our faculty. Um, so that's a reality that I, you know, that's a really sober reality that I don't want to forget inside of all the silver linings of the incredible creative output of our students is, and the collaborations of the faculty is the, you know, is, is like the work of trying to try, try to protect people's jobs um, so that they can continue to be present for our students. Um, I think I, yeah. I think there's also some concern that um, students um, are going to try to take a, a gap year. And I know that um, that the universities are concerned about that. And one of the things that came up is waiting for what? 
And I went, that's kind of a beautiful response because this is the reality that we have right now. And just looking at some of that work, uh, Maura, and I'm thinking about some of the work that my students came up with, I know that my practice and that their practice will be enlarged from this. And going into this, if um, it's unclear at NYU what the situation will be in the fall, whether or not we'll, it'll be a combination of live and, um, and remote um, asynchronistic teaching and all of that, which will be another whole la layer of complication to sort out. But I, I do think that the, the sensitivity and the awareness and, and, and for me as an educator, um, the feeling moving forward is one of more mutuality. And also I, you know, be careful what you ask for. I have always just wanted my practice to become more and more and more interdisciplinary. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who are, you know, in film and who are in video and who are in game. And I'm like, how can we incorporate, how can we bring that in? And all of a sudden some of that was starting to merge. And I'm like, oh yes, it's needed. It's not an extravagance, it's not a luxury. And also the work that we're doing is essential. It, you, can, you can feel how essential it is that artists are making their work and addressing this in all the ways that we are in a, in a way that is so inclusive and cross-cultural and interdisciplinary. And then also just one more thing that came up from watching, your, um, watching, watching what your students did was really being open to what your environment is internally and externally. So that, for example, that one moment where you have a girl through the door frame and one off to a corner, it's, so ma it's so magical. And so looking for these opportunities to, to transform this, these challenges. And, I, and I'm, I agree with you, I'm sensitive to the fact that this is going to be challenging um, in terms of budgets and it's gonna be challenging in terms of uh, students' um, willingness to take the, the ride. And I think it's, it, it's something that the more, the more we can just allow for the vulnerability and for the uncertainty, I think the better it will be. It just feels to me like the one thing I wanna say these days is like, live your truth. Um, and encourage each other to live your truth. It's helpful. We do have one question from the, I love everything that's being said. We have one question that's been inspired in the comments and they're asking, um, have any of you had other experiences with students who may not have access to online learning? And how do you know that? And uh, is that a concern for you going forward? Yeah, that's a that's a huge concern for CUNY students because it's it's public. It's New York City, um, and we there were a lot of initiatives. And even oh, I realized I didn't show hers, but um, the, the actual the very final um, thing that was shown for our festival was this uh, was a time lapse balcony piece that also includes the seven p.m. you know shout out to the workers. Um, and we had to get her, we had to get a laptop to her. Um, we had to get to get a laptop to another student. And, and this was, there was a lot of um, fundraising to get um, equipment at Hunter. And then sometimes the equipment being delivered, you know, not just shipped, but delivered to students. Um, we did, we were also just trying, but yeah, because of internet, you know, getting students there, um, like a cat five cable and dongles to, to make sure that they could do the live stream and um, but yeah it's a it's a big issue for for CUNY students not having internet access and it's definitely influencing the conversation about how to how to do a better job teaching in the future to to recognize and and have more space for that I feel like we kept asking you know one of the things I kept asking the other faculty for was was compassion <laughs> was just like let's let's like elevate the compassion level i know we want to impart information but what we really need to model right now is care um i agree um, i i think for 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 me i didn't have the experience of um students not having access to computers but we had some um, connectivity issues and one of my students was um also down in a basement 
doing. And I'm, are you okay down there? And she's, yes, my cousin doesn't like the noise. That, um, so like, I'm like, I'm like, you know, relegated to the basement, but it was this care. And it was like, like every, we we're all like, you all right. It was an unfinished basement. It was like raw concrete. And she did, oh my goodness, she did powerful work down there. I mean, it was amazing. And it was like, she was down there in the unconscious. Um, um, but yes, connectivity issues came up um in response to that question ryan yeah i mean i i also you know i have two new york city doe kids so non-college learners in my household as well and so was also just really closely watching all of the issues about access and technology you know the digital divide was was so present and uh, and i feel like we're still we still need to do a better job and um and it's like the electri the electricity act post depression like we had to get electricity to america the I, you know i feel like broadband should be a you know should be a right of every citizen um, because it's it's radically altering um, who gets to progress in school right now um, and it's uh, it's it's a very distressing thing as an educator actually to witness that gap kind of growing both both in the public university system, but also in just like the K through 12 situations. And everyone, so. everyone loses, everyone loses yeah. if, if the opportunity isn't there because the diversity is um, enlarging for everyone. We have um, one final question that sort of goes along with what I think you were already saying. It's uh, how do we cultivate hope among the youth in this dark time? And in the meantime, how can we compensate with the weaknesses of virtual learning? What's a sustainable perspective we can take on this? Which I think is a great last question. That's a great last question. Who asked that question? I want to find them. <laughs> it was uh, Abner, Abner Delina Jr. who's okay. tuning in. Wow. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to speak from the place I'm, I'm at, and I'm gonna cite somebody else, but Corey Robb recently in the New Yorker was talking about how the, you know, the pandemic is the time to resurrect the public university. Um, we know that students are recognizing with all of the, the job losses in families um, that, that access to education is really important. And, and I think as in, the, as in sort of New Yorker and in the New York sense, the, the ability to, to, if you can get back to campus, to be able to get to a local campus, um, you know, is is kind of is a is a hopeful situation. And but I think that the practice is, I think it we we should be encouraging more artistic practice out of every every student right now. You know, I, I think that every every student should be in in a class with me or in a class with Elizabeth right now. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with that. And also, you know, speaking of um, accessibility and um, just something equitable, uh, here in New York, this pandemic has hit uh, poor communities harder. It's it, people of color harder. And um, educa educational institutions have got to step up. They have got to step up and be responsive and create, and, and there's, there's huge human potential and gifts that are being squandered. Oh, I'm gonna get goosebumps. But anyways, I have hope that through this pandemic that things will not go back to what they were. They can't go back to what they were. There's just too much awareness and there's too many conversations like what we're having right now that weren't happening before that are now happening. And that gives me hope. That's, I feel that's a great way to end the panel discussion. Um, I, 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 it's been so wonderful to hear from both of you speak on this topic. And it's been such a pleasure to meet both of you through working at La Mama just personally. So I'm glad to bring you both together here today. Um, so much. Big air hugs. Yeah. Art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wonderful. Like, I want to scratch your beard so oh much. <laughs> I want to give yeah. you both big, huge hugs. It was such a pleasure, really, such an such a pleasure. I'm such an inspiration to um, work with you more on this. Yeah, thank, thank you, Brian, so much for putting us together. I really feel 
privileged. Yeah, no. And of course, like it is a privilege for, I always try to acknowledge during these live talks, you know, it is a privilege for us during this quarantine when people are facing these enormous obstacles to come together to eat and have a discussion like this. And so it really is a privilege for La Mama to allow me to sort of moderate these discussions. Um, and we will be back next week um, on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where I think we're going to be bringing another incredible discussion from leaders of arts institutions talking about how they are trying to uh, stay alive in New York City and continue making great work for their communities and their employees. And, the larger ecosystem. So please tune in next week. Thanks so much, everybody.